the fact that the there was such an uptick in the purchase and acquisition of weaponry tells me definitively that she had to know something was up. Honestly, how many long guns would have to be drug into your house before you realized something had changed? It's what's known as a pre-incident indicator, and there are actually several of them that uh, have been unfolding over the last 72 hours. Real Crime Profile is brought to you by many sponsors who support our podcast, from Casper mattresses to Quip toothbrushes to Madison Reed hair color to Sun Basket to so many others. So please, when you hear our sponsor, do check out the promo codes and the special offers for our listeners, and also go to realcrimeprofile.com where you can get up-to-date information on our latest sponsors and the latest special offers they have for our listeners. Remember, we can't do this without you, and we certainly can't do it without our sponsors. So thank you all for supporting Real Crime Profile. An army of federal and local L.A. County Sheriff deputies from the Lakewood Station stormed house after house in Hawaiian Gardens early this morning. They were out arresting members of a Latino gang mainly operating in the Hawaiian Gardens area. Agents also seized scores of handguns, assault rifles, and other weapons. They say they have indicted nearly 150 members of the gang and associates for numerous violent crimes, including shootings and more. Investigators say there are federal racketeering indictments detailing guns and drugs. They say the gang is notorious for targeting blacks. As you spell out in the indictment, uh, we learned during the investigation of this case that this particular street gang uh, has a hatred towards African Americans, and they would target, on occasion, African Americans not African-American gang members, not African-American uh, anything uh, other than the fact that they're African-Americans. Hello and welcome to Real Crime Profile. My name is Lisa Zambetti and I am the casting director for CBS's Criminal Minds. And with me today is Maureen O'Connell, retired FBI agent from the Los Angeles field office. Uh, I've worked there for 25 years. So what's going on today? Where are Jim and Laura, you're asking? Well, <laughs> I'm sorry to tell you, they're not here today. You're stuck with me. You know, last year, our longtime listeners are going to remember that Jim and Laura had to go on a super secret assignment out of town that we couldn't talk about where they were reinvestigating an old case. And um, a lot of you know what I'm talking about. Well, guess what? They're at it again. That's right. They're reinvestigating another very famous case that many of you are very interested in. And it's taking every ounce of self-control not to tell you what that case is. <laughs> My hands are like... And unlike Lisa, I have no problem keeping <laughs> secrets. I actually enjoy withholding information from people. That's what I like about you. Um, so anyway, so they're not here today. The kid is driving the car. Hopefully we won't crash. And Maureen O'Connell has agreed to be here today. So I met Maureen um, at CrimeCon. When was that? That was last yeah, year. Last year in Indianapolis. She was part of the XG team that we all descended upon Indianapolis. And I didn't get to know her that well, but I, I know about her. And I thought, you know, who could I drag in here to talk to me about some things that I know you guys are going to find fascinating? Uh, there's a million things I want to ask her. But first of all, can you just tell people how you got into the FBI, what your journey was there? Because a lot of our listeners want to join the FBI, they want to get into this kind of work, whether it's what you did or behavioral science and stuff like that. So can you just give them a little bullet point? Certainly. Um, I grew up on the south side of Chicago, and my mother's dear, dear childhood friend was the AO of the Chicago FBI field office. That's the person that's in charge of every single solitary FBI employee that is not a sworn FBI agent wearing a gun. So it's a very, very big job that she had. And she would talk all the time about the fine men of the FBI and the wonderful work they did and how great it feels to make a difference in this world. So I one day proclaimed as a young girl that when I grow up, I'm going to be an FBI agent. And they both laughed rather uproariously and said, honey, there are no female FBI agents. And I said, well, when I grow up, there will be and I will be one. Get and out. So there were literally no, that was just unheard of to be a female FBI agent? Yeah, there weren't agent? any. People always ask you, what are you going to do? What are you going to do? And the expectation is that you know what you're going to do. And of course, I wanted to be an FBI agent, but I knew it took like two years to get in. And who knows if you're going to make it? There's three major stage and each one 
you lose like upwards of 50% of so the So it's a cut system as you go through? Cut, major. It's, it's an evisceration practically. <laughs> so I wasn't sure I was going to do it. And then um, senior year in college uh, or senior year in high school, I my mom came home and I was crying, which I don't do often because I'm a pretty optimistic person, um, which is a blessing. But she said, honey, what's wrong? And I said, mom, you always told me, to find, to do what I love, and I'll never work a day in my life. And she's like, well, why are you crying? I said, because I love everything I do. And she goes, that is nothing to cry about. You should be celebrating. And I had a, finally, when I got into the Bureau, the thing I realized most was, guys, it's just the coolest job on the planet. And when you get tired of one thing, we work over 700 different violations. So like you said earlier, Lisa, you know, you could be behavioral science. You could be working gangs or narcotics. You can work um, major uh, financial institution fraud. You can work terrorism. You can go deep undercover. The continuum is so great. Yeah. It, can, it can just keep you just enraptured mm. for over 25 years. So I always thought that you had to be like law enforcement first and that feeds you into the FBI. Are you telling me that's not true? No, that's not the case. Okay. We do have quite a few agents that are former law enforcement, former military. We have a ton of attorneys. We have a ton of um, accountants. We have uh, people that can come in under the language program. It, it's been a long time since I applied, obviously, but um, you can anyone can go to FBI.gov and look under jobs, and it'll show you all the different um, ways you can work for the FBI. And there are a lot of what we call professional support positions that are just all the professional support positions are crucial, but ones that might be just as appealing to you without having to carry a gun and mm -hmm. go through all that rigmarole. So you were saying that when you were a little girl, there were no female FBI agents, and here you're going through the process of becoming one. How many women were around you when you were going through? By then, were there, was it, it was more common? The, the Bureau was 8% female when I came in. And just for clarification, I believe there may have been one female that was actually considered an agent, but I'm not sure she ever left the office, and that's one of the things that I, I, I think there may have been one, but there were none uh, when I was that little. Right. So 8% female, and uh, people would say, wow, wasn't that really hard being one of the... No, I, it just wasn't for me. I have uh, The FBI is a place where you're never going to be paid any a dime less than a man for doing the same job. You know, that's been my norm. Yeah, I heard you say that. Somebody at CrimeCon came up to you, a young woman, and was asking you kind of the same question I just did. And I remember hearing you say that Nobody ever messed with you. Nobody ever harassed. Like you never felt like your gender was in any way any sort of handicap or no. like you. But you know, aren't are you from a, a family of brothers? Is that right? Yeah, I have I have two brothers, but it's my three sisters that um, yeah. toughen me up. I, I mean, anyone that has three older sisters knows exactly what I'm talking about. <laughs> <laughs> and my poor mother having six kids. I but I'm just wondering if your background, you come from a family of law enforcement, you know, public service, Absolutely. tough. Absolutely. And like, Iron workers. Uh, yeah. I mean, I mean nobody's going to fuck with you. I mean, you are sitting here right now are a presence. I mean, more. she's, okay, one, she's beautiful. You have a physical beauty, but also a physical presence. Uh, you command attention with your voice. And seriously, she could bench pass me right now. I mean, she could, like, throw me out the window. She has a Doubtful. strong... <laughs> uh, I mean, you just ha are strong. And I mean that... I in have the a strong best... chi, like what they talk about, your that inner yeah, sure. energy. Sure. But I grew up on the south side of Chicago, and we had a lot of challenges there. And um, and I grew up playing sports. Mm -hmm. And I love, I love being athletic. I love being outside. I love... All that stuff. So I had to fend, being number five of six children, I had to fend for myself. And mm -hmm. no one was going to give me anything. I had to, you know, get it. Right. Go right. out and fight for it. So you go through the process of being in the FBI. What, just what are the first steps in that process? I'm just curious when you went in. You just, well, when testing I went, or yes, training? They, or? Do, they do all kinds of testing. They test everything from your, uh, they give you one of those really comprehensive psych tests to determine if you're batshit crazy or not. Well, I'm out. <laughs> Clearly, <laughs> and they do. Uh, they they test you for firearms. A lot of mm. um, physical fitness, physical proficiency. You have to be able to do push-ups, pull-ups, sit-ups, and all that kind of stuff. Um, so, 
you know, there's there's all that, and then uh, it, it it the intensity seems to really um, crescendo, and then it sort of drops off once you reach that third point, and then you go to the academy. The vetting is so uh, thorough that by the time you get to the academy, especially now, your chances of getting um, kicked out are relatively low because they vet so well, mm-hmm. which is which is good because. It costs a lot of money to um, put someone through the FBI Academy. And how long is that training? Is that at Quantico? Uh, no, you got me. I think it's like five months in Quantico, yeah. Okay. And then I guess it's like when you go to college and you're looking at electives and trying to figure out like what what path you're going to go on. How no, do you... you don't pick your path. Oh, okay. No, you don't pick your path. You're mm-hmm. assigned your path. Gotcha. Everything you do in the Bureau, specifically um, uh, back then, but it's still true today, is based on what we call the needs of the Bureau. So if the Bureau needs you to, um, you know, work on some big case, you're going to get TDY'd, like temporary duty over to that investigation. Mm-hmm. When you're in the academy, you don't even know where you're going to go. They have you fill out a list to um, to say where you'd like to be assigned. And uh, they have all the um, all the cities in the United States listed, and you, you list them from uh, one on down. And you generally get uh, the one in the middle or toward the bottom. Not always, just kidding. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but there's a day in the academy where you get your orders, and each um, new agent goes to the front of the class by themselves with an envelope. They open it up, and they have to read out loud where they're going to be assigned. And the people that get Alaska, of course, it it in, it engenders a big, oh, no, or wherever. <laughs> and it's, it's uh, funny, you know, so... So what was in your envelope? Los Angeles. Los Angeles. So I was happy because I, um, you know, I came from a big, big family, big loving clan, and there's still, you know, everyone's there in Chicago. And I just wanted to get away for a couple of years. I thought it would just be a couple of years. And here I am, Lisa, right. I'm still here. You're still here. Mm-hmm. We're so glad you're here. So, you know, Maureen has worked on so many different kinds of cases. I guess you're most famous for your work with LA gangs. You want to talk Probably. about that? Probably. Mm-hmm. I, um, I was fortunate enough to be assigned um, to the LA Sheriff's Department uh, Elite Gang Task Force out in um, Compton. And that was a real, that was a real challenge. That was a little more challenging because when I first went there, I know these guys. I know the. Uh, I know how local law enforcement officers are because I come from a big family of them. And when I walked in, they, you know, you see it on TV sometimes. We don't always see it in real life, specifically out in Los Angeles, where we have such a great relationship with so many law enforcement agencies. But initially, you know, they were a tough audience, and I knew it going in. So I just rolled up my sleeve and did whatever they wanted, and. Uh, you know, now we're like family. We go mm-hmm. to each other's weddings and baptisms, bar, bar mitzvahs, whatever. But uh, uh, it took a little work. You got to be humble. You got to leave your ego at the door. You got to work your ass off and uh, you have to bring it. And when you say you're going to do something, you better do it or you're going to hear about it. Right. And I, I work very well in that environment, believe it or not. So you're interfacing, you know, with regular cops. You're the FBI agent. Who has the senior, you know what I mean? Who, Who has leads? the lead? Yeah. Well, the case was uh, the, the case was essentially prompted by the murder of Deputy Jerry Ortiz, and Jerry Ortiz, by all accounts, was just a true American hero. He was a kid that grew up and uh, worked his life to help young kids everywhere. He had a boxing studio for the young, um, you know, all the kids that were at risk. He did everything he could. He volunteered. He was a great dad wonderful husband, and really super handsome. Not that that has anything to do with anything, but he was mm-hmm. he was just one of those guys that had it all. Mm-hmm. And he got murdered trying to investigate um, Hispanic gangs that were shooting at black people just because they were black. And I'm not talking about gang-on-gang activity. I'm talking about innocent black families that were just trying to better themselves, and uh, they were trying to kill them. So... Jerry went after them like he did everything with a vengeance, and um, he went up to a door, and unbeknownst to him, the murdering coward was behind the door, and when the old lady answered the door, the murderer had um, his gun within the crack of the door 
and fired a round right into Jerry Ortiz's head and killed him. That, uh, was a heartbreaker. It broke my heart because, you know, my dad died a duty death as a uh, firefighter in Chicago. Oh, so did my uncle. I'm so sorry. And so you, you, you got it. You got it like deep in your gut. Oh, it's, I got it. Yeah. I mean, I've been to way too many law enforcement funerals. And it is it is a nightmare, and it is it, to, you know it's it's called blue racism. I went there, and we started on a uh, we just we they they had started already doing the first wiretap before I came on board. Then I came on board. We ended up doing thirty three back to back wiretaps, which is unprecedented. Um, we worked night and day, weekends. We answered anything, and we. Em embarked on a multi-pronged approach that would blow anyone's mind. The level of dedication in these men that I worked with was just mind-blowing. It took everything I had. I'm a worker, and I'm a person that rolls up my sleeve, no problem. It took everything I had to keep up with these guys. I mean, it was, it was to say it was impressive is just an understatement. Yeah, they were on fire. They were very inspired to do we that. We were on fire. And I mean, for five years, we were on fire. And it ended up being the largest gang takedown in U.S. history, the largest RICO indictment ever written, and both of those still stand to this day. And that was in, I, I think, our uh, 2007. Hey, buddy. Yeah, Mommy? Did you brush your teeth? Yes. Today? Yes, I did. Look at my toothbrush. Oh, my God, what are you, smashing the brush against your teeth? The bristles are all flat. Did you brush your teeth for two minutes like the dentist said? I guess so. How long is two minutes? Okay, this isn't working. We're getting you your own Quip. What's a Quip? Quip is an electric toothbrush that packs the right amount of vibrations to help you brush better. So, no more smashing? No more smashing. In fact, Quip will deliver brand new brush heads and toothpaste right to our door. And best of all, Quip has a built-in timer that reminds you how long to brush and when to switch sides. Hey, it says here that Quip was called the Tesla toothbrushes. Yep, super cool technology and super affordable at just 25 bucks. And our Real Crime Profile listener can get their first refill pack free with the purchase of a Quip electric toothbrush. So go to getquip.com slash real crime. Spelled G-E-T-Q-U-I-P dot com slash real crime to get your first brief little package free. Back to the street gang. Agents say they started tracking the gang about four years ago after a reputed member of the gang, Jose Luis Gerardo, killed 35-year-old L.A. County Sheriff Deputy Jerry Ortiz, who works out of the Lakewood Station. So when you're wiretapping... What are you trying to learn? Is it just intelligence? Is it like what is the what is the information that you're looking for? Well, first of all, in order to get everyone's like, I think someone's listening to my phone, and my standard reply is, trust me, you're not that interesting. In order <laughs> for us to tap your phone, someone's got to write about a seventy-five to one hundred and twenty-page affidavit. Sure, we have to prove that um, that. What we want to get from you, we can't get from any other avenue. We can't get it from surveillance. We can't get it from talking to other people. We can't get it from informants. This is There's all kinds of hurdles you have to go over. And it has to be signed off by a judge. And uh, so you get a 30-day um, order, generally. So in this 30-day order, if you don't get what you thought might be there, it gets turned off and you can't do it again. But oftentimes you'll get another phone call, like a call will come in and it'll be what we call a really dirty call. And that dirty call from the other person may give you enough probable cause to go up on their phone. So see, that's mm -hmm. how we did it. Mm -hmm. But we found that uh, a lot of the women were um, no shock to any of us, but the women were really facilitating a lot of these shock calls from the prisons. They go to visit their, pardon me, they go to visit their significant others and they come back with some orders, so um, we decided we were going to go after the women, too. And I said, I'll be the face for that, no problem. And uh, we did. We were hell-bent on justice. Oh, my God. This is just like The Wire, I think. This, this, I don't know, did, did you ever watch The Wire? Yeah, The Wire was great. Yeah, yeah. But this it was, was like The Wire. Yeah, because it's like there's, there's somebody in prison who still is in power and calling the shots through people right. in their neighborhood. That's, that's crazy. So... So you, did you were you did you arrest the women first or did you somehow you know I'm just interested in the whole process of it and 
are you gathering what like are you gathering evidence on the drugs that they're moving? Yes, or? yes, yes, yeah. yes, and yes. Yeah. So we we um, everyone that we hooked up or arrested, we tried to flip if we thought they had good information that would help us move forward. Um, we arrested people on all kinds of drug charges, um, and and what we're doing is we're putting a puzzle together, and the puzzle has to be comprehensive. It's got to be complete. The hallmark of any good law enforcement officer, uh, law enforcement officer, or any good investigation, is to follow the facts and only follow the facts. I don't want anyone to think that we were on any kind of a witch hunt because we weren't. Um, we had the coward murderer in in custody, which, by the way, we found him with. I think his pants were wet in in the tub, um, hiding in another place nearby. Right. Big shocker, but. Um, we go where the facts lead us. So when we arrest people and we find stuff and we put it together and we examine it and we look at the evidence and we talk to other people and we go back to everything that we learned on the last um, takedown we did or be it large or small, we worked and worked and worked until we got to our big takedown. We did um, a couple of, uh, we did two gargantuan takedowns, one of which included 1,500 law enforcement officers from all over the country. We had SWAT teams. We had to bring in SWAT teams from all over the place. We pretty much shut down Hawaiian Gardens and, um, you, know, you know. Leading up to that, you must be just it, the adrenaline pumping in you, or are you just a cool customer? You know, it just seems no, like the adrenaline, the, what we call it, we, we call it popping hot. The adrenaline is popping hot, and you can feel it. But that's usually on the day of a warrant or the morning of mm -hmm. or— but the thing about adrenaline is when you come down from adrenaline, you about slip into a coma. Yeah. I mean, it's one of those times where you wake up and you're drooling and you don't know who you are or where you are. <laughs> That's the aftermath of uh, adrenaline. Right. What FBI skills do you bring to that situation that are different from the law enforcement that's already on the ground in there? Well, I brought a different set of resources um, since I was assigned to that case. I could bring behavioral science people, look at someone. I could have our evidence response team, which I was a part of. So the FBI's ERT is a, is a fantastic, unbelievably skilled set of individuals that volunteer to go over and above their regular assigned duties to join the evidence response team or ERT. We get training that is just world-class, and we, um, we are specialists in every dis every different discipline that you can think of you know, under the realm of uh, CSI. So I would have um, our ERT team work on one or two of our um, uh, crime scenes that we came across. There were murder scenes that I would look at or I could send back to headquarters to have them review. The Bureau could pay for one or two of the wiretaps. Each wiretap at that time I think was $30,000. What? For one. Yeah, that doesn't include manpower. Oh, my God. Yeah, they're very labor-intensive, and they're not yeah. 24 hours a day unless that's part of the order. Okay. But, um, you know, we would go from, I would base it on me personally. If I would surveil them first, and if, if, if I'm looking at you, Lisa, and you go to bed at um, 2 in the morning and you get up at 11 a.m., that's what I'm going to base my wiretap on. Mm -hmm. So that I'm, only, I'm not listening from 7 a.m. to 7 p.m. Okay. I'm listening when you're awake. Right, right. I want, I want you to tell me, Having faced everything that you faced, and I know we're going to talk about a case that you've worked on, but what scares you? The lack of situational awareness scares the hell out of me because in every single active shooter, every single mass murder, any, uh, you name any large-scale event, significant event, and there were signposts all along the way that no one saw, no one reported, and I mean... Just to really dummy it down, how many times do you pull up to an intersection and almost hit someone, even like a mother with a baby, and she's just looking at her phone, pushing the carriage right out into the street? I, it's just mind-blowing to me. So connect that for me about when you're talking about mass shootings. What are the signposts that are actually actionable? I mean, I know that people have been talking about red flags and the, you know, the many mass shootings we've had recently, but a lot of them you, know, you can't arrest somebody for being no. an asshole or being odd or being, you know, like what? Right. Well, for in the particular instance of the Las Vegas shooter, he purchased, he more than doubled his cache of weapons within one year. 
And those weapons were long guns, and um, uh, he had a sniper scope, and he was buying bipods and all this other, and the bump stocks. I mean, someone should have reported that. I don't care. We're not asking you to, we're not asking the general public to do anything other than to report it. We'll connect the dots, and we'll put these clusters together. So we're looking for clusters, essentially. So one of them would be the acquisition of weapons, one of them would be a change in um, your physical appearance, like you become more unkempt, et cetera. One would be um, um, disassociation from people and friends and sort of turning into yourself a little bit or any other major change. So any of these on their own, you know, is not going to get anybody arrested. So you're just saying that you would start to monitor this person or just keep them like, so then what do you do with that information? You know? Well, I think a, a, a better question right now would be, or a better answer would be, what do you do with the information when you see something? Because everyone says when you see something, say something, but say something to who and in yeah. what form? So the FBI and local law enforcement all have um, websites and everything where you can put in tips or leads. Even if you just Google tips or leads and the name of the department near you, you can um, submit tips or leads. There are fusion centers throughout the country that have tip or lead um, sections that will push that information out to whatever law enforcement agency is responsible for that um, particular event. For, for example, here in Los Angeles, we have the JRIC, the Joint Regional Intelligence Center in Norwalk, and they have fantastic outreach programs, one of which is called, the prim primary one is called InfraGuard. It's the FBI's public private sector outreach program, of which I happen to be the national president. Okay. And in regard, if you become a member, or even if you don't, you can submit a tip or lead online, and that information will get to wherever it should go. Okay. And it's funny because it seems like after these kind of shootings happen, very quickly we know who, the name of the shooter and all these things about them. But again, what could law enforcement have done to deter that? Just how could... Having all of, I, I guess a I'm, lot of these things yeah. can't be thwarted. I mean, yeah. unfortunately, the round has left the chamber, as we say in law enforcement. Meaning, it's we're almost beyond that point. Um, but the acquisition of all those weapons should have should have triggered a lot of bells and whistles and red flags. Mm -hmm. And I really don't understand how that didn't. I under the I know that the ATF has a database or a system wherein when uh, any um, large number of handguns are purchased that they, they get a notification, but they don't get the notification with long guns. I would be shocked if that doesn't change, like, immediately. Mm -hmm. So uh, that will be one thing. But um, okay. other than that, I am not sure, unfortunately, what we can do. Getting a good night's sleep is easier said than done, especially if you think you just heard a noise downstairs. Or you can rest easy knowing that your home and family are protected with Simply Safe. When you install your Simply Safe home security system like I did, you're arming your home with powerful sensors that actually tell you if a door opens or if a window breaks. There's a 105 decibel siren that alerts you at the first sign of trouble. And you'll have a dedicated team of security professionals watching over you 24-7, ready to send the police. So with Simply Safe, there are no long-term contracts. Around-the-clock monitoring is only $14.99 a month. Get $100 off the exclusive summer package at simplysafe.com slash real crime. Hurry, because this sale ends July 31st. That's $100 off at simplysafe.com slash real crime. When you're an abused woman or an abused person, even a child, you're on the defensive all the time. And when you're on the defensive, you're not able to make good, solid, offensive decisions. So that could definitely impact the uh, overall scenario. However, I don't think that these markers, um, all these markers could have been missed. And I'm not saying that this could have been prevented because I doubt that seriously. But the amount of but, but planning, right. yeah. the amount of planning that went into this attack is just insurmountable. Well, I know that you were going to talk to me about a case. You had asked me what case haunts me, mm -hmm. and one of the cases that haunts me is actually a uh, an LAPD case. 
In the 90s and 2000s, the FBI ERT team, we decided to start working with LAPD Homicide, specifically the Pacific Division, because I had a um, one of the kids I grew up with in Chicago. and His dad was a cop, and his mom and I uh, were, his mom and my mom were good friends, and we went to grammar school together and everything. He was a homicide detective in Pacific Division. So I decided to, um, he was telling me one time that resources are so slim, SID, which is their CSI, um, you know, it's hard to get them out there to really spend time because they're having so many shootings and murders and everything. So I said, hey, we've, we're always looking for training, and we spend a lot of our time trying to figure out training scenarios, figure out training scenarios. Why don't we just join forces, and our team will work with you? So we worked on several um, high-profile and low-profile homicides together. And one of them really, really broke my heart because um, it involved a young Russian girl who was the only child of her parents, and she was sent over to this country under the ruse that she was going to be an au pair, and that was not the case at all. They wanted her here for um, the sex trade. Mm -hmm. Um, And when you go into these cases, Lisa, even if it's a bank robbery or money stolen or uh, whatever child abduction, whatever the case is, you just delve into the details and you go to a dark place that you never even thought possible. You know, people wonder why cops are so salty and everything. You see enough of the situations like the one I'm going to talk about and you'll understand exactly why. There's a category we call things you can't unsee. Yep. And when we start seeing all, you know, after your 25th session with things you can't unsee, You just, you know, people get all worked up about stuff, and you're like, yeah, congratulations. Unfortunately, that's not even pinging my radar, so (laughs) good luck, you know. But in this particular case, this young girl, her parents sent her over here with all the money that they had saved. They sent her to Los Angeles, where she was promptly picked up by a Russian man, pimp, piece of crap, oxygen thief, at, uh, um, at the, I think it was the bus station. She came downtown LA from LAX in a bus. Anyhow, they picked her up and uh, fed her drugs against her will. And within 48 hours, she was addicted to heroin. Then they uh, kept her at a drug dealer's, uh, or she was working for a guy downtown, a pimp that was doing this to all kinds of women. And the guy that um, this pimp was buying drugs from who lived in Venice, Big Al, they called him, a a Russian guy. Big Al went to um, uh, provide him with some drugs. The pimp didn't want to give up money, so he gave them Alyssa. And Alyssa Sologubova, I believe that was her name, she was beautiful. um, And I still remember the photo. I can still see her face in my mind, and she had a a mole on her neck, and the reason that's important is I'll tell you in a little bit. But um, she was held in an apartment in in Venice, and it was a uh, like an eight-unit place where you walked in the front center, and there were four on each side, and and then there were uh, actually more upstairs. And she stayed up there with a drug dealer, and this drug dealer dealt slung dope to some major, major A-listers, and I mean like in the top five or ten. I'm not going to name the one person because I personally know that he's done everything in his power to come back around. And When you say A-lister, you're just in general. You Hollywood. mean Hollywood A-lister, okay. Huge A-lister. He used to go there every day for drugs, and um, but he's turned his life completely around. But he hung out with this person. So we started working this case because Alyssa was found at the Hyperion water treatment plant. Um, She had been stuffed down a sewer. She was dismembered. And um, we didn't know initially if she was cut up and stuffed down the sewer or if she was pulled apart by the um, uh, mechanics of the high flow of water and a bunch of ladders down there and everything. So it was. they were so happy to have us on the case because we were able to throw a ton of resources. We spent... uh, we had uh, we hit the warrant we hit the house early in the morning with a warrant one day, and as we walked into the place, you can assess a um, a building generally from the exterior. You know, we scan everything as when we look at things. We scan people, we scan cars, we scan situations, 
And when I pulled up to this uh, place, it was O Dark 30, as we say, and it looked like a really nice apartment building in Venice. I mean, it wasn't... Oh, really? So it wasn't like, it no. didn't look like a slum It wasn't lords. gross at all. Yeah. It was nice. It was really nice, actually. And I came up through the front door. It was clean. It didn't smell. Yada, yada, yada. They hit the door. Uh, and um, actually, when, when the SWAT guys hit the door, I was right outside. And I got up on the radio and said, we have activity in the front window. They were up. And the light turned on. Anyhow, we get in there. It was the filthiest, most disgusting apartment I may have ever been in, which is shocking because yeah. I have been in shitholes that would blow your mind. They had a fish tank that stunk. It had dead fish in it. It was green. It was a swamp. It was... I mean, I don't know. The carpeting was sticky. It was sticking to the bottom of our boots. I mean, it was gross. And the man that lived there was a troll, this this drug dealer guy. But anyhow, we went in and we spent about eight hours with Luminol looking for the place where she was murdered. Because we didn't, as I said at that time, we didn't know whether or not she was cut up or if she was uh, pulled apart. So we didn't come up with much, and as is the case in many of these uh, investigations, you hook this person up and you're not sure if they're going to spend any time in jail at all. Mm -hmm. You know, just the shame of being arrested may be the only thing they ever suffer, which is horrible. So we got him out in front, and he I'll never forget, he had a black T-shirt on, and he had uh, no shoes or socks on. We had him hooked up, and he's standing there. And... uh I can't even tell you how gross he was between his, I don't know which was more disgusting, his teeth or his toenails. <sighs> and I told him that. I was like, dude, you are, because he was mouthing off to us and yelling. And uh, and I, I just said, buddy, with those toenails and those teeth, you shouldn't be talking to anyone. Oh. He did some time for the, um, he did some time for the um, drug charges, but he was never charged with that murder. And I know I just spoke with a homicide detective on the way in here, and Mark said, you know, the last time he looked up, looked him up right before he retired, uh, this guy was living out in Riverside, but we're convinced beyond uh, anything that he did it. Uh, the coroner came back and said that she was strangled. He said that she was dismembered by the um, force of the water, not by any instrument. Mm -hmm. The, um, uh, the uh, scars or the marks were um, like pull uh, were caused by pulling, mm -hmm. not by uh, a sharp instrument. Mm -hmm. um, but he's the the coroner did say that she was strangled. He was still able to see that. And the reason I talked about the mark on her neck was because she had that mole on her neck. And there was a photo that we got. I don't know if it was from missing persons or her family, but uh, her head was tilted to the side, almost like she was modeling. And she had this. Um, you could see the mole on her neck. And so when the coroner turned her head to show the mole and took a photo of it, unbeknownst to him, it was just this eerie, eerie depiction of what had happened to her from this beautiful young girl that came to this country with such big dreams, yeah. with her head tilted in just this way, and then to have the picture of her head turned in the exact same way, oh, my just God. to scientifically show the mole in the right. same position. But the, the differentiation was just... The juxtaposition is Yeah, just, the juxtaposition oh just broke your heart. And then her parents had to fly here from Russia, and the LAPD has a bunch of um, linguists on hand to help with different situations. And they had these two ladies that were Russian linguists, and they um, picked the parents up, and they were translating for them the whole time. They ended up, the parents ended up staying with these Russian translators the whole time, and they became friends, and these wonderful translators became a source of great comfort to these people who had to come here to bury their daughter. Had, the, had there been a search going on for her as a missing person, or did she come to your attention because her body was found, or how did it all kind of start? That Her body was found at the Hyperion, and then the parents, uh, then we found out that the parents had been trying to get in touch with her and weren't able to. So, um, oh man, not the first body found at a water treatment plant. And I have to say, this is not the first story I've heard like that of of 
you know, women coming here from other countries and being traded for just all kinds of things. And I think disgusting. Yeah, I, I know our <laughs> on criminal minds, you know, people do a lot of research into crime, obviously. And where our studio is, I think one of the writers told me is like the hotbed for what do you call it? Human trafficking. And it's this very, you would never, like you say about the apartment in Venice, like you would never dream that this neighborhood with very nice houses and very nice schools is like a hub of that kind of activity. I mean, the things that go on that we don't see are astonishing. Well, Lisa, if you think of before the internet and before Google, um, I remember being a brand new agent and we had some bad guy, I forget what case it was, but he had like some sexual fetishes, which I, at that time, I didn't even know what a sexual fetish was. And we had, you had to go to bookstores or old video stores back in those days and rent out these creepy, disgusting videos. So this guy was in one of these video stores one time and I had to go in and make like I was looking for something. And another hallmark in this line of work is you have to be able to be completely gobsmacked and not show it on your face. I was walking through those aisles. I was like, granny porn, oh. what? <laughs> Foot porn, oh my God. pregnant women porn, all this stuff. I was like, what is going on? Yeah. I mean, it's disgusting. So that was, you had to have a different level of um, commitment to do that. But with the internet, with um, um, encrypted apps, you can do anything. You can get your freak on at, at home. And that has exploded the industry. People think that human trafficking, uh, those numbers must be going down. They have absolutely exploded in the last 20 years. It's like, you know, before you may have certain inklings towards one thing or another, but you could never act on it. Now it's so easy. And I, what I tell people is, don't ever open the portal. Resist the urge to open these portals. Because it seems to me that once you get turned on by something like this, it's a rabbit hole mm -hmm. that you don't want to go down. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> We've covered a lot of ground, but I want to ask you about what you're doing now. I, you have your own company? Yep. I have my own company, Maureen O'Connell & Associates. And I do consulting work and security work, high-level stuff. Um, we, uh, we search for, we do all kinds of stuff. But one of the things we do is we search for bugs. And it's just interesting that how cheap bugs are, so you can buy them anywhere. And people place them in each other's homes. And you think it's for, like, blackmail. And a lot of times it's people are just voyeurs and really once again getting their freak on. So it's just like normal people. I mean, I would think that maybe, like, big businesses are trying to spy on each other for yes, corporate secrets. Yes, there's a secrets. ton of yeah. that. Yes. Yeah. And so private jets, like if, you're, if you have a, um, if you use a jet uh, sharing company or something, I don't know that I would talk too much business on there unless you're sure that they get uh, searched for bugs because that's, a, that's, that's pretty interesting. Boardrooms do it. Most big businesses with a lot of intellectual property, they do it on a regular basis. Um, uh-huh. Most companies, they have a good, a pretty good understanding of what the risk is. They've got great security directors. A lot of these security directors, almost 100% are all former law enforcement, a lot of them FBI. So they understand the risks involved. And we put on a lot of training. And uh, uh, so, yeah, I, I'm doing a lot. Right now I'm working. Um, I'm a contractor. I'm going to be going to Puerto Rico to help um, with the communications uh, for the people that are reestablishing the grid. Wow. So it'll, it's, the conditions are supposed to be pretty austere. So this will be like being back in the bureau on ERT. Right, some right. Crazy crime scene. Well, I say this to Jim and Laura all the time, but I'm always so honored to sit down with oh, one so of sweet. you. I mean, it's true. You're a hero. I mean, you do you go where we don't go, where we can't go, and you know things, and you see things that we shouldn't see. Right. And I just... I'm amazed by you in so many ways. So sweet. Aw, I'm not. But anyway, um, anything you want to, you know, I always like to ask people if there's anything you want to recommend, any book you've read, any TV show you've read, any charity you want to promote on our show. 
you know, uh, Jim and Laura and I are watching Mind Hunter right now. I, don't know I you, love Mind Hunter. Have you been watching it? Yes. Yeah. So we're taking it all apart, you know, kind of episode by episode. And I've got lots of things to say about the casting and all that stuff. Um, but what do you love to watch? Are you like a Homeland kind of girl? Or? Nope. I've never seen Homeland. Mm-hmm. I'm going to eventually watch it, I think. But um, Are you a real Housewives kind of girl? Absolutely or? not. <laughs> um, I like watching true crime stuff. Mm-hmm. And I also, I love watching British television. Me too. Oh, I love Acorn. Yes. I love everything British. I can't decide whether to get Acorn or there's another Brit box. They both have, like, pros and cons, and my listeners are trying to, like, let me know, like, what's better. I just got but, Acorn, and I, it's not as easy to navigate as Netflix, I oh, okay. say. I don't know. But I love, um, uh, I love Swedish mysteries. Yeah. I love all the uh, – because uh, there's two things I like. I like the true crime stuff where it's, it's, it's a little rugged, but it's uh, – I, I can also learn something. So when it's in a different country – I like looking at the topography and the um, uh, the characters. I like listening to different languages, yeah. and it just kind of removes me from wherever I am. But I also really love watching things that transport me. So I love old classic films mm. because then it's easy breezy and it's light and airy, yeah. and it's um, I can just look at it from an artistic standpoint. Um, and that's about it as far as a. Uh, Charity, I, it's not really a charity, but the program I told you guys about, Infragard, I-N-F-R-A-G-A-R-D dot org. Infragard dot org is the FBI's public-private sector outreach program, but we put on training for um, um, active shooter scenarios and all this kind of stuff all the time, but we need money to do it because, the, as you can imagine, the need is so high. So if you go to infraguardlosangeles.org, you can um, uh, donate there. It's a 501c3. You're not actually giving money to the FBI. It's a separate 501c3 that a lot of us that are former FBI agents are a part of because we really believe in the mission. And um, that's, that's that's great. I'll that's post it. that on our Facebook page and our listeners. And I think just um, you tracking your path into the FBI will be very inspirational to lots of our listeners because they're very active, they're very engaged, and a lot of them are heroes too. So, and they would love you all, know, to take your advice. All you young women out there, I encourage you strongly to try to become an FBI agent. It, it'll take a while to get in there, but I'll tell you, if you're lucky enough to be chosen, you will embark on the ride of a lifetime. Just an unparalleled journey. It's amazing. The Bureau right now is less than 20% female. We're looking for qualified candidates, and it is just unbelievable. Well, if I had to do it over again, I think I, I, I You'd might have been. You'd be great. <laughs> You'd be great at it. Oh, God. <laughs> Maureen, thank you for thank coming you. in and jumping in while Laura and Jim are away. I hope I did a good job. You I'm did. sure if I didn't, our listeners will let me know. But um, And I'd love to have you back on anytime. Anytime. And I love Jim Clemente. He's my buddy. Who doesn't love Jim Clemente? My J. Clem. And Lady Laura. Okay, we're going to sign off for now from Real Crime Profile. Bye. If you like our podcasts, there are a few things you can do. You can take two minutes and go to Apple Podcasts and leave a five-star review. You can also check out all Real Crime Profile offers and promotions and our sponsors in our show notes. Another thing you can do is go to Facebook and like our Facebook page, and you can also follow us on Twitter at Real Crime Profile without the E. And one last thing, please tell your friends, family and colleagues about us and spread the Real Crime Profile word. Thank you so much for listening. We really appreciate all of our listeners. Real Crime Profile is produced and edited by Paul Francis Sullivan. Sound engineering by Mike Thal. Music is composed by Simba Tsumba. Logo art by Jim Clementi. Real Crime Profile is produced by XG Productions and distributed by Wondery. For advice and support if you're experiencing stalking in the UK, you can contact Paladin National Stalking Advocacy Service on 0203 866 4107. Or you can go to the website where there's a lot of information and advice that you can follow on www.paladinservice.co.uk. If you're experiencing domestic abuse, you can call the National Domestic Violence Helpline for free on 0800 2000 247. 
In the US, if you're experiencing domestic abuse and need advice, shelter or counselling, you can call Genesis, the 24-hour hotline, on 214-946-4357. You can also go to their website for further advice or support, www.genesisshelter.org. And there's the Domestic Violence Hotline on 800-799-7233.